Chapter 6 As they overlooked the hill, Tuscaloosa, the last and great king of Mabilia, rose at sunrise and stood in its haze. And as he finished his final prayer, he rolled his feet in the wet grass and stared. He carried a baby ox on his broad and bulging shoulders, then laid the ox upon a stone and sacrificed it. He watched the hawk swirl above his head and descend on the carcass of an antelope, and he watched them chew, squawk, and feast. More hawks flooded the sky, and the sight made him smile. He took out a spear and dug it deep into the hard sand and stones, and as the wind turned, he felt the blood rush to his face. Tuscaloosa's son watched him from afar and disappeared beyond the hill. Then the great Tuscaloosa strode through his land and watched the tens of thousands of his people gather and pray to the sun. He joined his warriors soon after and shared a meal with them. They gorged and swallowed long slabs of ox, and Tuscaloosa greeted each warrior with a smack on the shoulder and an affirmative nod. When he finished his meal, Tuscaloosa climbed back up the hill and looked down at his kingdom. An hour passed, but he remained alone. At dusk, his son approached him. They walked down and reached the river. They stood ankle deep beside the water, and from there, they prayed. His son sighed. Tuscaloosa tilted his head. Father, yes, I had a horrible dream. So did I, said Tuscaloosa. He smiled. His son did not. His son asked his questions, and Tuscaloosa answered. Did you see the skies? I did. Were they red? They were red like blood. Did you see the river? Yes, I saw the river. Did you see the bird? I did. Did it die? Yes, it dropped from the sky. Shouldn't we prepare, Father? Prepare? Yes. No, we need not prepare. We will welcome it, whatever it is, whatever it may be. We'll let it come to us. There's no need to prepare. A week passed in Tuscaloosa land. It rained three times, and the whole of Mobilia was covered in mud as the late sweltering summer approached. Strange servants emerged from the woods and approached Tuscaloosa. A crowd had formed, and excitement and confusion soon followed. Hours later came the ruler, and as the lady of Cufita Chete made her way to Tuscaloosa, she looked very sad and tired. She bowed to Tuscaloosa and spoke. Her servant stood and relayed her words. Tuscaloosa immediately noted the lady's beauty as he fell deep into her eyes. Her face was beautiful, but bruised. Her body was slender and tight, but the most distinctive feature was her eyes. They held a strong and prominent fear. I've come to warn you, great Tuscaloosa. I've come to warn you and your people, said the lady. These spirits are coming. Tuscaloosa's eyes fluttered. He yawned and lost focus. The lady yelled and pointed. These are evil, evil souls, she said. They will kill you all. I know these things, dear lady. I sense them. You needn't warn me. The lady's face turned to shock. She pleaded at Tuscaloosa with her hands raised high. If you wish to survive, you must leave. 
They are within days of you. They are more powerful than you can imagine, O oh, king. There will be a terrible war, and you will lose it. They've destroyed my kingdom. They'll destroy yours just the same. Tuscaloosa remained silent. His face remained calm. The lady continued. They have no mercy. They'll burn you all. Leave. Please leave. It's the only way. Then Tuscaloosa approached the lady. He turned to his people. Leave? Our people do not leave. We fight. We die. We do not leave. The lady sobbed and fell to her knees. Tuscaloosa looked down at her, and the lady pleaded all she could. Her face was red and filled with tears. The river will run red with the blood of all your people. Then let it run. Let the whole river run. Let it freeze in the winter. And let it thaw in the spring. Let the river run, as it always has, red or not. Do what you do. I only come to warn you. And I thank you graciously, my lady. Then Tuscaloosa rose his hands in defiance. He shouted and turned to the crowd once more. And so it be, and here it is. Let them come to us. We've been waiting for this battle our whole lives. The crowd cheered, and Tuscaloosa rose his hand. The lady uttered her last words. She couldn't be heard, but she said them anyway. She stared at Tuscaloosa, bowed, and sighed. I'm sure you have, O oh king, but so have they. And as foretold, September had passed, and so did the kingdom of Cusa. And as October rolled in, the Spanish marched on. A strange and peaceful week had passed. Then another. But on a sweltering morning, they found the city and the great kingdom of Tuscaloosa. And on that sweltering morning, the Spanish found their new kingdom and its surrounding cities. They came across a rolling green hill and saw the fires of the village that seemed to go on for miles and miles. They spotted the palisades and the enormity of the land. They fixed their eyes on the gigantic fortress that set upon its center and Soto examined the huge mounds, and the rolling green land reminded him so much of Peru and the lands of Machu Picchu so long ago. Moscoso, yes, Don Hernando. Take Ortiz, go down. Tell them I want to see their chief. Yes, sir. Tell them I am the child of the sun. They will know. They don't fear death. They can't anymore. Sir, these people, we will oppose our will. That is all you need to know. Soto mounted and followed the cavalry. His captains rode close behind him. The army divided into twenty platoons and approached a massive fortress. They stopped and planted small wooden crucifixes to the ground, and when they got close enough, they halted and stood in formation. On the other side of the hill, Tuscaloosa stood with his army of 500 warriors in back of him. The rest of his army, the 6,000 of his beloved comrades, remained in the nearby towns of Mobilia, some five miles south. And in the wind, they heard each other's echoes. But Tuscaloosa ignored these echoes and looked away. 
He bent over and sharpened his axe against a slab of stone. He gave a solemn glance to the river, and a small yellow bird landed in front of him. He breathed long and hard in the warm air, and he stared at the orange clouds above his head. Then his son came to his side, and Tuscaloosa smiled, watched the bird disappear, and handed his son his axe. They're within the river, cried his son. We stay, said Tuscaloosa. Why? You must learn, my son. Then Tuscaloosa stood up, walked forward, and his army followed. At midday, the armies met, and as a custom, the priest and the peacemakers made their way down first. They were soon accompanied by Moscoso and his team of five cavalrymen. Behind them, the whole of Soto's men marched a quarter of a mile in phalanx position, and the Mobilio warriors watched them all. Immediately, the drums of the Tuscaloosa army blared, sounding louder and louder. And within minutes, the armies were within 200 yards of each other. The drums overtook the screams, and the leaders walked towards each other. And it was there the Spanish first caught glance of the great Tuscaloosa. They shook their heads in bewilderment, for he seemed to be the tallest Indian they had ever seen. Soto initiated his first peaceful gesture. He brought forth a coat made from freshly skinned deer, and the servants quickly brought it to Tuscaloosa. After the exchange, Tuscaloosa squinted and spat to the ground. Ortiz rushed in and replaced the priest. He read the decree, which Soto had rewritten. And in the slew of spoken words, Soto and Tuscaloosa glared. The translation continued. They stared deeper, and all the memories of Peru flooded once more through Soto's mind. Then Soto drew forward and whispered to himself, Just like Altawalpa. He turned to his subordinates and threatened them with his sword. Do not translate a single word. Soto faced Tuscaloosa and with great delight, he said his words. He held the bloody spear and placed the tip firmly upon the ground. This is a land of bastards, and you must be its king. Hello, great king. It is our pleasure. We welcome you, O great king. You are a great chief, I hear. A king of kings. You'll never understand a word I say, so I will tell you everything. I am the devil. I am a liar. I am a child of the sun. Nothing was translated as Soto commanded. Tuscaloosa's glare turned into a slight smile, and Soto continued. You will welcome us like long-lost friends. And I know you will want us all dead by the morning. We want nothing but the same. So, dear king, whatever shall we do? Tuscaloosa snarled and closed his eyes. I admire your honesty, said Soto. Soto ended his speech and said not another word that day. Another offer was made. The Spanish brought trinkets from all the places they traveled, but Tuscaloosa refused each and every one. Then Tuscaloosa turned his back as if Soto and his army did not exist, and his people followed him through the dark. Dusk settled. They shared no meals. They shared no offerings. Another night came to pass, and a great bonfire was made. Tuscaloosa and his army remained well within reach, and Soto's army made camp 
and remained baffled as the day they were born. In all waking hours, Soto did not sleep. He sat by a dying flame and heard the wails of the warriors from off yonder. Then in the morning, Soto stood up and stared directly at the interior walls of the palisades. With a small band of priests, translators, and horsemen, Soto drew forward. And just as he thought, Tuscaloosa was already waiting for him. Ortiz commanded the translators and commenced another trade. The meeting was long but peaceful, and it dragged on for an hour. Many times the translators had balked, but Ortiz commanded them to repeat the gestures of the previous day word for word, and all waited for Tuscaloosa's response. An initial trade commenced. It was of stones for bundles of straw. A trade of fresh fish and bottles of wine followed. Bands of food were brought to the Spanish, consisting mostly of fish, clams, and oysters. After the trade, Tuscaloosa spoke, and Ortiz relayed the words to Soto. He says we have been invited. He says he will be pleased to share his food with us, and that tonight we shall dine together. Soto smiled. Then he waved his hand. Tell him that I greatly accept his offer. At dusk, a horn sounded. The whole of the town came and surrounded the Spanish and kept their distance. And soon, a thousand of Tuscaloosa's people emerged from the darkness. And as promised, the Spanish sat and ate their meals. The Mabila servants served their meals on giant fig leaves. The meals consisted of the fat of goats and rams, baked calabasas that were stuffed with corn and dried beans and long and sumptuous legs of venison that were seared and slathered in hot chilies. Though delicious, the Spanish ate their meals with heavy skepticism. Among the pits were many bones and skulls scowled about the fire. It was later said by the priests that these bones were of the tribe that the Mabilia destroyed two years before. Later, they were brought the soup that contained the marrow of both buffalo and the skulls that lay it upon the ground. A priest approached Soto and announced that he was summoned to sit next to Tuscaloosa. With Moscoso at his side, Soto sat adjacent to Tuscaloosa and marveled at his appetite. He watched Tuscaloosa swallow and gorge his meal like a rabid wolf. He watched Tuscaloosa breathe heavily through his nose, and he watched him eat spicy chilies, dozens at a time. And as he came to the fire, Soto watched Tuscaloosa urinate and spread his arms to the sky, shouting a prayer to his gods. After the meal, the women danced and gyrated to the rhythm of the drums. More chilies were served during the next course of rounds, and as the Spanish ate more and more, they screamed and hollered for water. And the Mabilia smirked and laughed. The first stars of the night emerged. Tuscaloosa gathered his translators. He spoke in a deep and powerful tone which matched the depth and the power of his giant athletic body. With grace, Tuscaloosa told his stories without pause, and the Spanish imagined the tale word for word. Tuscaloosa told the tale of the day his father died. He cried many times as he told his tale, and his eyes grew soft and dim. And Soto sat and listened. The fires of the night burned and died, and Soto slept in a small tent not far away from the houses. But he slept only at a sheer exhaustion. His mind still raced, and he thought about his next move and what pieces would fall. Morning arrived, but even before sunrise, Soto and Tuscaloosa were up 
and they met each other on a soggy hill. They climbed for about a half an hour, and it began to rain. It rained in slants and gushes. But Tuscaloosa gave no hesitation, and he pressed on through the mud. When the rain ended, the sun returned, and as it did, Tuscaloosa stopped and prayed. The heat returned. The air grew dense, and each man sweated from head to toe. The translators paused to catch their breath, but Tuscaloosa kept at prayer. Soto studied Tuscaloosa's bulbous nose, his wide face, and his thick, dark lips. And when Tuscaloosa finished praying, Soto asked his questions. The translators responded. Tuscaloosa gave no answer. Then, Moscoso handed Soto a rapier. But Soto refused. Clear that away, he said. And as ordered, Moscoso placed the rapier back in his cloak. Some hours passed. The priest recited mass beside a set of willow trees. And a half a league beyond them, the mobilio priest and priestesses danced a slow, drawn-out dance to welcome the midday sun. Each downbeat of the drums reverberated and found its way into Tuscaloosa's pulse, though he kept his hands quite still. A light appeared from the clouds, and Soto said his words. We were told of your riches, great king. We kindly asked to see them. But again, no answer was given. Tuscaloosa took Soto two miles north to the hot springs. Steaming hot water emerged from the ground, and Soto stood amazed. The deep, trenched water bubbled and seemed to boil. Above the stones, the water fell in long and pristine streams, and it hovered over in thick clouds of vapor. The two remained alone. They set their translators away, though they knew both their guards, servants, and warriors were watching their every move. Tuscaloosa undressed, and he waited for Soto to do the same. It took Soto quite a while. He undid his armor, cloak, and pants, and Tuscaloosa loudly mocked as Soto's pale, white, and sickly-looking flesh. Soto shivered, but after he entered into the warm water, he felt at ease. Tuscaloosa swam to the edge of the spring. He stood and rested, and Soto followed. An hour went by. They bathed and kept silent. Tuscaloosa nodded and drifted off into a deep sleep. But Soto remained aware and alert. His eyes turned red, and as Tuscaloosa snored, Soto spoke again. We've trekked your sacred mountains. We followed the great river, and it led us here, here to your glorious kingdom. How far does your kingdom go, great Tuscaloosa? How dark will it be when we take it all? but Tuscaloosa's eyes remained shut. Again, Soto stared. And when he looked up to the sky, he smiled. Finally, the servants came forth and tended to Tuscaloosa. They did the same for Soto. They bowed and fanned leaves. And Tuscaloosa opened his eyes. And Soto nodded. An hour later, they dressed and left the springs. They came across a river, a mighty one, but it was not the largest. They watched the crest gleam, fold, and run against the mud. And for a single second, Soto looked and thought of how he got here, how much time had passed, how many rivers he had passed, and how far he still was. From the hill, 
He studied the hall of the Mabelia Nation. He noted the twelve towers and the fortresses, and he thought of all the gold that was days from being had. Night came, and the festivities commenced. The Spanish drank and rested. The drums banged and boomed. The Mobilia women danced and gyrated, naked in the dim moonlight. And the Spanish took the ones they most desired. During the midnight hours, Seto shared an entire bottle of wine with Tuscaloosa. They emptied it quickly, each taken long and absurd swigs. And all throughout the night, Soto watched the sweat pour down Tuscaloosa's bulbous nose. To return the favor, Tuscaloosa took out his pipe and lit it afire. He smoked deep, hard drags and passed the pipe over to Soto. Then Tuscaloosa spoke. My son said he had seen you in a dream. The words drifted into space. Tuscaloosa then took Soto's hand and sniffed each finger. Then he took Soto's hand and held it near the flame. And as it burned, Soto did not flinch. He merely stared. Tuscaloosa released his hand and Soto responded with a smile. Then Soto held a chess piece and showed it to Tuscaloosa. He handed it to him, but Tuscaloosa simply tossed it up into the air. Then Tuscaloosa let go of his stare and departed. He joined his people and danced the rest of the night away. And Soto and the Spanish solemnly glared at him, like statues amidst the dark. This horrible game, it was still there. It simply would not end. I knew I was going to lose, but I didn't care a damn. But I knew it mattered to Soto. The whole world seemed to depend on it. Even in the flicker of the firelight, I saw the blood on his battered hands. And Soto once again strangled the board with his eyes and waited for me to blink. Nothing made sense. I saw no openings. I saw no seeable way. His army, his control, and his fear were all present in those tiny pieces. Indeed, this was his game. And indeed, Soto had probably invented this game. He invented it before time and before God. And the times in between the moves, I thought about it all. Throughout all the battles and all the blood, Soto remained alive. If I would have killed them then and there and put them out of his misery, perhaps I could have saved more lives. But I was afraid. Definitely afraid. Like I always was. For the fear pervaded and controlled me, just like it always did. And Soto knew it all too well. There was no joy in Soto's face, no solace or comfort. He looked numbed and damned and dead all over. We paused for the longest time. I faded in and out of sleep. And neither of us made a move in all that time. He had lost his mind. That was the only thing I knew for sure. I knew it because I had once lost mine. But I knew Soto went further. God could no longer help him. For, in his mind, he had become his own God. Self-sufficient and not of this earth. He abandoned all. And I saw it in his eyes. 
that ceaseless evil. He was dead inside, and I could no longer feel pity for him. Then Soto made his move. His back bishop took my pawn. The center was gone, and he had gained complete control of the board. For three more days, the Spanish stayed in Mabelia. But as the days unfolded, there were no more celebrations, or dances, or prayers. There were only demands and denials. On the first day, Soto stalked Tuscaloosa and repeatedly asked for gold. And Tuscaloosa, as expected, did not utter a word. On the second day, more and more native guards separated Tuscaloosa from Soto. They pointed sharp sticks and arrows at Soto when he had gotten too close to Tuscaloosa. And Soto threatened to unleash unbridled holy hell to all the lands if this behavior did not cease. But his threat went unheard. Soto paced up and down Mobilia, desperately wanting to reach an agreement with the king. But Tuscaloosa refused to hear a single word. And on the third day, the 18th of October, Tuscaloosa retreated into one of the houses and never returned. In the morning, Soto gathered his men and approached the tent. He took Ortiz, a dozen archers, three horsemen, and one heavy cannon. Then Soto gave his captains each their orders, and their men went on and stood in formation. And for an entire hour, Soto shouted out his final demands. The decrees were read by the priests, and the Spanish proceeded with their tired formalities. They whispered and wondered and waited for a signal. But Tuscaloosa remained in his tent and refused to speak. Soto, though, remained obstinate. He said his words, his last warnings, and his demands, and he spoke with all conviction weighing his words carefully, as if Pilate on the throne. It's quite a strange thing, O king, is it not? Your kingdom is quite large and very beautiful. I shall hate to see it all burn. You are an intelligent savage. No doubt. I will not deny that. More and more warriors emerged from the houses as it reached noon. Soon, thousands of warriors shouted in all directions, rattled their drums, cried to their war gods, and encroached forward. But Soto went on. But you know what we want. We've told you many times. We've come all this way. We cannot breathe without it. Just give it to us. I'm offering you a chance. One final chance. You know what we want. We know what you're hiding. Just give it to us, and all of this will be avoided. Then Soto called out Danasco. Take a slave, cut his throat, save the head, then send it to Tuscaloosa. Why the head, said Anasco. Tradition, said Soto. Tuscaloosa received the slave's decapitated head about a half hour later. He laughed heartedly and tossed the head to the ground. In the rain, Tuscaloosa simply smiled and embraced the sky with open hands. Then Soto climbed up on his horse. He stared back towards the houses and said these words. They say beyond the river is the city of gold, and in that city we shall see God himself. Just beyond. 
They say you too are a child of the sun. They say a lot about you, oh great Tuscaloosa. They say the same of me. We must be brothers then. I accept that. Pleased to meet you. Hold on to your beliefs, great king. But you must understand, brother. We come in peace. But we will not hasten to kill you. All of you. If you do not comply. I know you're about to ambush us at any minute. It's the stock and trade of you savages. It's the only thing you know. We've asked you kindly. We've warned you. You think we're not gods? Good. More and more immobilia warriors gathered from either side of the hill. Soto ordered the heavy artillery to move towards the end of the tree line. Then the cavalry maneuvered ahead of them. The archers stood along the wooden palisades. The captains commanded their orders, and the main infantry divided into pairs and sprinted down the hill and towards the gate. Then Soto raised his sword and drew it back into his cloak, and the men halted. On the other side of the hill, Tuscaloosa shouted. His booming voice still echoed in shouts and shrieks. The warriors jeered and cursed. Finally, Ortiz approached Soto. He says we will not dine with him tonight. He says all of our men are to clear out of this land this instance. We are to... But Soto interrupted. Tell him we shall do no such thing. Then Tuscaloosa spoke no more. The mobilia drums took over and sounded across the entire land. Cracks and booms and hisses and thuds. And in the chaos, Tuscaloosa bent over and picked up a spear. He ran and threw it and screamed with all his might. And Soto, watching him, just smiled, just as he did at Katimaka. Soto returned the gesture and signaled for a cannon strike. The explosion burst and shook the earth. And the battle for Mobilia began. The warriors sprinted out. They surrounded the Spanish and killed as many as they could. The Spanish found themselves trapped inside the fortress. And through the smoke, the warriors rushed and speared and tore away. Another cannon exploded. But by then, the warriors had already seized the center and ripped apart Soto's formation. Soto turned from side to side, realizing just how outnumbered his army was. He quickly sounded a retreat as the Spanish headed away from the town in full panic, and the warriors went right after them. In the first hour, twenty Spanish soldiers lay dead on the ground. They had been speared, scalped, and set on fire. Hands and feet tossed into the air, and blood stained every blade of grass. Along with the men, the Mobilia women took arms and catapulted themselves to battle. The Spanish archers rallied, set, and fired. But the Mobilia warriors continued to strike deep and hard. They sprinted downhill with spears in their hands and they launched and jousted and toppled the Spanish. Bright, bulging fires let the ground asunder, but as the cannons kept firing, the hull of Mobilia soon turned into a fog of boiling ash, soot, and smoke, and the Spanish cavalry reacted with utter confusion. The Mobilia warriors continued to sweep along, outnumbering the Spanish. Endless surges pierced through Spanish formations, and Tuscaloosa himself ran into battle with a spear in one hand and a Spanish sword in the other. The Spanish gradually retaliated and gained ground. What followed in the next hours 
was an endless stream of madness and sheer cacophony. Blaring trumpets, booming drums, spears and clubs, swords and pikes, streams of slicing arrows, blazing musket fire, screams, shrieks, and blood all over. At the midpoint, the ground was littered with bodies and dead horses, limbs, whole torsos, intestines, and organs scattered all about. Already a thousand mobilia corpses lay dead, and the remaining four thousand continued to fight with everything they had. But what finally swayed the momentum was the constant barrage of cannon fire. The blast wore down the mobilians, and the Spanish kept firing. Shell after shell pounded the earth, and the huts and temples and stables and granaries were all lit asunder and incinerated. Another hour passed. Two thousand more warriors lay dead on the ground. It was then that the infantry finally gained control. They spun and sliced away, and Soto relished it all as he watched the spears fall down from the sky. He directed the cavalry to catch the mobilias off their rear flank. The cavalry dug deep into the advancing party, and they slashed and trampled and lanced. The battle was over, and the slaughter began. And the story remained the same. Much like all the battles Soto had ever fought, and through the fires, the Spanish cut and slashed away. The army reached the corner of the gates, took rusted whips and mail, and pummeled the Mabilia archers one by one. Their faces were mauled into bloody pulps and were later decapitated. And in the spews of blood, Soto watched his men. He saw Vicente seethe with demonic rage, and he watched him and many other Spaniards stab and stab every warrior they came across. Since there were no more shells to fire or any shrapnel of any sort, the Spanish artillery ceased to fire. And the rest, the thousands upon thousands of others, cleared away from Abilia. But those who stayed made sure they died valiant deaths, including the great Tuscaloosa himself. The Spanish burned what was left of Mobilia. They threw torches to each and every longhouse, and the thousand remaining natives screamed, ran, and fled the city. Throughout the nights and days after Mobilia, Soto staggered on alone for hours at a time. His armor was stained in blood and filled with arrows. Below, he walked upon the corpses of warriors, women, children, and horses. They were all dead and forgotten. His eyes fluttered in the fallen ash. His nose inhaled the swirling smoke, and his face seemed to gleam besides all the embers of the blood stank land. In the twilight, the men found Tuscaloosa's corpse beneath a pile of splinters. When Soto approached, he nodded and studied it closely. All that was left was the torso and the head. His legs had been chopped off. His face had been scorched and burnt. And his skin turned purple. Soto paused, then requested to be alone. And throughout the starless night, Soto remained with Tuscaloosa's corpse and dined with a bottle of bitter wine as his men watched on from afar. Long live the king, said Soto. Hours passed. Soto laughed. He dipped his finger in the bottle, approached the corpse, and pressed the wine along Tuscaloosa's dead lips. And as the wine splattered and dripped, Soto howled again 
and shivered. The night's getting very cold, O oh king. He stabbed the corpse one last time, and Seto fell to his side and slept. The morning after, Soto returned to his men. The trance continued. Rankel first approached him. They discussed the casualties. Did you get a number? Uh, yes, Don Hernando. How many? Ours or theirs? Ours. Fifty. Don't lie to me. Is it fifty or is it eighty? It's eighty, sir. How many wounded? I don't know, sir. I, I pray not to guess. Soto watched his men as they made it through the smoke. They choked and slogged. There were no cries of joy. There was no celebration. There was just silence. It was a victory, only on the ground, but not in the mind. They winced and hobbled and tended their gaping wounds, and the monks gathered around the Spaniards and blessed every corpse. The captains found each other late that afternoon, but they said not a word. Instead, they stared at Soto and his dead giant eyes. And once more, Soto sat by Tuscaloosa's corpse and said what was on his mind. Oh, great king, you're the only one who seems to understand what sweet power we once had. Well, the tide has turned. One can only hope to die quick. Every man needs his leverage, but not all men understand. Nothing more than years. Nothing more than pieces on a board to capture, to capture. But I cannot have my lady, nor can you. Such are our fates, you and I. Ha! We continue to worship our cruel gods. But we never ask why. Then Soto severed the corpse's ear. He watched the blood pour onto the grass, and he placed his hands along the stream, but the blood remained. Soto placed his hands in the water again. The blood still remained. A whole painful minute passed. And the longer Soto stared at Tuscaloosa's head, the longer the head stared right back. And after a minute, Soto screeched and hollered. Then he grabbed the head by its mangled hair, and he cried with every ounce of rage he had. Go ahead! Scowl at me! Scowl at me and weep! You're dead! You son of a bitch, you're dead! Scowl! Cry! Worship me! Worship me!